uh, I guess you're coming to this at, at a uh, auspicious time. And the reason why I say that is because my dad is um, fighting a uh, battle to bone cancer okay. that isn't going really all that well. Yeah. Um, and in you know a whole kind of I'm kind of going to go right into this actually just because um, it's imperative to kind of move into it at this mm -hmm. point. One of the things that I've been doing, you know, since a pretty early age, you know, I started um, more of like a mind-body journey, you could say, when I was right around 12. And my first um, teachers in this kind of um, path were martial artists, you know, and traditional style martial arts. So Goshen Jiu-Jitsu, Japanese style Jiu-Jitsu, and then Chinese martial arts, and and also yoga philosophy, yoga philosophy from India. Um, and there's this ideology and this concept that all these esoteric and Eastern traditions share. And the ideology is, is that we as a spirit, individual spirit, are in union at all moments mm -hmm. with the universal spirit, mm -hmm. this ideology of oneness, right? So, right now I'm in a, a very interesting time. It's sad. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. It wakes me up. And yet, it allows me to have an opportunity to be fully, mindfully present for somebody I care about and love mm -hmm. in a way that I've never really had to be before. Mm -hmm. Um. And the body-mind approach, at least from where I'm coming at right now in my perspective, is something that allows me to at least stay grounded in this process. Mm -hmm. So you being a survivor of what my father is somewhat going through mm -hmm. um, is an interesting perspective mm -hmm. because I have to come to an acceptance at this point mm -hmm. from a mindfulness standpoint that he will be leaving his physical body. Mm -hmm. It's to that degree, you know. Um, well, when I went through my time, you do a lot of reflection on your whole life. Mm. And it's actually made me, um, I'm a stronger person. Mm. I mean, I, the second bout of cancer, I was given less than a 30% chance of surviving. Oh, wow. wow. So, I survived, I have grown, but now I kind of feel a little stagnant. Mm. <laughs> so mm. kind of okay. need, I want to get to another level. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about how to, how to do that, mm -hmm. how to do that today. Um, by the way, I'm Sean and you are? Betty. Betty and you are? Kathy. Kathy. Okay. Um, welcome. Welcome. You kind of came in as we just kind of began, so oh, your okay. your timing is good. Your timing is good. <laughs> 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 but um, we'll kind of kind of get right into it a little bit. So um, number one, we'll just kind of go around, and since it's a small group, I, I don't want to make this more of like a lecture kind of thing, but I do want to impart some knowledge to you. Um, but I want to do it in a way that's more of an open dialogue and communication. So what drew you to this? Uh, lecture today. I'll start with well, you. Well, I've attended one of the other lectures and found it very interesting. Okay. I just happened to look at my paper today. And oh, okay. Right over okay. Do you have a uh, body mind practice now? Meditation, yoga, no, spirituality? I, well, I do yoga, and mm -hmm. I've always been interested in the, the mind kind of things, and mm. meditating, mm -hmm. things like that, so I thought I might learn something. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I didn't quite know what your topic was going to include, but I'm interested in what the mind can do to the body mm. <laughs> in terms of, um, so I was told that I had a, something wrong with my arm, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with my arm, and as I left that situation, my arm began to get <laughs> uh, stranger all the time, mm. and I'm sure that something my mind has done to my body, so I thought it was like that. But I do meditate, mm -hmm. and um, I do yoga. Mm. Okay. So do you practice yoga here? Hi. Hello. How are you? 
I'm good. How are you? Do you practice yoga here at, at Spa Wall uh, then? No. Or do you have your own I, personal? I'm going to, but I, I, there are a couple places I go. Um, I go on to Suma, mm -hmm. and I do water yoga there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then down here at the Western Reserve, they have a nice uh, uh, functional yoga for mm -hmm. you know, people with asymmetry balance mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll talk about the deeper aspect of yoga okay, today. Great. Okay. Your name, Miss? Kathy. Hi, Kathy. How are you? Good. Okay, what draw you here today? Um, There's a little bit more of an open dialogue to start, at least. Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, I actually came like an hour to come here. My mom lives in the area, and she had mm. been to some of the talks here. Mm. And she gave me the calendar of what the kids are doing, so I was open today. Okay. So I came okay. to check out one of the talks. Okay, all right. So one of the best places to start as far as this whole idea of they're calling this lecture more of a body-mind programming. Mm -hmm. you know, I come in and I do various different lectures on various topics. Uh, my background, I've been doing esoteric practices. Uh, started off with martial arts, meditation, yoga, and that kind of stuff since I was 12. Um, so my upbringing was, a, you could say, very different than uh, typical. But in exploring all these traditions and looking at all these esoteric traditions, which are more internal work kind of traditions, more about introspection, self-study, self-analysis, meditation, that kind of stuff, there has been themes that all of them share. And one of the biggest themes is the use of using the breath to link your mind and your body. All these traditions have a, a similarity in that way to where the breath and how we breathe and the vastness and the depthness of our breath, how deep the breath is, the structure of our body, the quality of our mind, etc., are intimately linked between the two. So the breath is what bridges the gap between your mind and your body. And they all share this. Like, I haven't found a tradition that doesn't. Um, having studied, you know, Buddhism, Zen, um, Sistema, Russian military martial art, they utilize breath practices in their martial art. Tai Chi, yoga, all this stuff, right? So one of the most direct ways to link your body and your mind together is to start to breathe in a way that is long, slow, and deep. So when your mind's agitated, what typically happens is you'll notice that the respiration in people that have either anxiety attack, panic attacks, and things of that nature, is the respiration is fast, right? Very rarely does somebody have a, uh, be in an anxious state and be breathing in that kind of way. It's more like, you know, it's more like kind of like panting style breath, right? But the breath is something that we can control. So it's one of the few functions anatomically in our body that is both autonomic, happens automatically throughout the day, we don't have to think about it, it happens, and also something that we can direct our attention to. Okay? So this idea of body-mind programming is where we direct our attention. So think of attention just for a moment as a muscle. Right? And then in this day and age, Many people, young people especially nowadays, because I, I own a gym, to give you a little bit of background on me, but I own a company called Soul Fuel Tribe, and I work with kids, uh, usually starting around the age of eight or so, and I already notice that their attention is so split up into all these different technologies nowadays, like iPhones, iPads, video games, etc. And very rarely do they have the ability to center it on one thing, and this becomes habitual over the course of time, right? We develop these habits of letting our attention wander and wander and wander. So attention is something we can train. In the process of body-mind programming or body-mind mastery or meditation, as they all kind of fit within the same realm of things, is the ability to control and regulate your attention. And think of every time your mind wanders as a repetition of becoming stronger with your attention. Does that make sense? Right? So, you know, I personal train people, I make people stronger. When they come to me, they might be able to do a certain amount of weight on a movement, right? 
and then later I either add more repetitions or more weight and they become stronger. Well, tension is very much the same way. Over the course of time, when we start to close our eyes and start to pay attention and direct our attention to our breath, which we're going to do here momentarily, we strengthen the muscle of attention. And the less we use it, the weaker it gets. The more we use it, the stronger it gets. So all the traditions share a regularity in how much they practice, right? There's no one-day meditation course where you're enlightened, mm -hmm. right? I don't know of any. If you know of one, please tell me now. Because <laughs> I've been on this process for a long time, and I'm not there quite yet. And you'll notice that there's like a waxing and waning with this process. So for the next minute, okay, just to again kind of be a little bit of energetic back and forth versus me just lecturing you. I am going to start my timer. And for the next minute, I just want you to keep your attention on your breath. I'll tell you when that minute is up. And then by a show of hands, we'll see who succeeded for one minute. Okay? All right. So close your eyes. All right. Use my timer here. And begin. Hear your thinking. <laughs> Open your eyes. So, by a show of hands, how many successfully were able to keep your attention just on the breath without the mind wandering or anything else? Okay, so three of you. Okay, or four of you. Sorry. So, this idea of, again, directing our attention is usually something that very few people have the ability to direct it and hold it on the point of concentration for long durations of time. Usually it wanders. And it's only because it's, again, something like a muscle that if you don't use on a regular basis, it atrophies. Hi, how are you? Sorry. That's okay. Hey. That's okay. I'm sorry. I'm so, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So, uh, that's okay. To do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'll give you a quick kind of rundown of what we're, we've talked about thus far, which isn't quite that much. But um, all the esoteric traditions, all, all the body-mind programming traditions, yoga, Zen, Buddhism, any path of meditations, Qigong, Tai Chi, all the traditions share the idea of training your attention. And training your attention with the utilization of either focused breathing or just drawing your attention to the breath and watching their aspiration. I haven't found a tradition that doesn't utilize this kind of ideology. Then attention is something like a muscle. So they've heard this already, but I'll kind of I'll give you two um, the idea of this. When we're talking about body-mind programming, we want, at least in my opinion, to look at it in such a way where if the mind wanders and we bring it back to the point of concentration, that it's a successful strengthening of the idea of concentration. And in order to get into a body-mind state or a place of meditation or a place of quietness and stillness within, peace, tranquility, that kind of thing, this needs to shut off, right? But we don't turn it off. We direct the attention elsewhere. And now all of a sudden that bridge between the mind and the body is now starting to link and link and link and link because of the attention to the breath or some point of concentration that over the course of time we spend developing. So I'll give you a little idea. I've gone on silent meditation retreats. And the first one I went on, I was, I think I was right around 25 or so, um, 37, or 38, jeez, I just turned 38. But nonetheless, it was a week long of not being able to say a word to anybody. You ever done one of these before? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, the only thing you could say was like, excuse me, I have to go to the bathroom or, you know, like basic stuff, you know, like, okay, pass me a fork. But you couldn't hold conversations or whatever. So it was a seven-day retreat. I was initiated into a practice called Kriya Yoga when I was uh, 19 years old. And this was the first long retreat I took in that lineage. And it was one of the hardest things to do because we're so used to conversing. We're so used to letting the energy come out of ourself and be in this communication versus being in stillness versus directing all our energy and our attention inward. And something that these traditions spend a lot of time with is that. They collect the energy. They conserve it. It's within themselves. And now they just sit and they meditate and meditate and meditate until the mind no longer wanders, no longer turns. The term and the analogy is like a monkey mind, right? So what I'm going to give you all today is some of the concepts of how to utilize the breath because we're in a room that we're seated today. So body mind mastery also includes, in my opinion, movement practices like a Tai Chi or a yoga or an asana, phys physical practices to keep the body healthy. Okay? In the yoga tradition, asana, which is the physical uh, structure of the body, asana means steady seat. But it also means the postures that we use to keep the body healthy and sound. So when we sit and we try to find a state of peace, our body doesn't ache and send signals to our mind that distracts the mind from the ability to hold it one pointed in stillness. Does that make sense? Right? So if we don't have a healthy body, then all of a sudden when we sit and meditate, we feel all the aches and pains in our body. Now this is, again, another opportunity actually for mindfulness. Because every time we feel that sensation, if we can direct it back to the breath or direct it back to the point of attention, um, whether it be the point between the eyebrows, which is another common one used, or the utilization of sound, like an ohm style meditation, which we'll do maybe a little bit of something like that today as well. You're, again, directing your attention and making it so strong that now the mind has no more ability to turn. Okay? Chitta Vritti Narodaha is the second verse in the Yoga Sutras. It means to stop the cessations of the mind. All right. Most of us maybe can do that for 30 seconds to a minute. But very few can do it for uh, uh, long durations of time and really get into a state of peace. So I'm going to try to give you some tools to do that. So let me see how many are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Perfect. Perfect. So the first thing that we're going to do is you're going to partner up with somebody. And I know this is, might take me off camera a little bit, but maybe I'll have two of you come up here, okay? And the reason why we're going to do this is we're going to start to study where the breath is within our body. So I'll stand up, okay? Can I borrow you? Can you come up for a moment? So the first uh, idea of breath, right, in all the traditions, this is something they all share, is how we breathe. Where does the breath emanate in our body? Exactly, abdominally, okay? Where should it emanate? We should breathe big. However, the majority of people breathe in the chest, and that creates a little bit of extra tension in the body. It changes the hormonal secretions of the body. It does a lot of things that are not really ideal. Okay, it increases neck tension, like people that have stiff necks and stuff like that. Usually, they're chest breathers. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to place my hands mm -hmm. on your clavicle, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to place my hands on your intercostals, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to place my hands on your abdomen, okay? And I'm just going to observe how you breathe, okay. and then I'm going to have you do the same thing to me, so you can feel okay. the difference in breath, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Do you mind? No, I don't okay. mind. Okay, okay. If you do, just please. No, speak. I don't okay. mind. So you're going to partner up and you're going to do this momentarily. I'm going to take about a minute to do this. Mm -hmm. And again, you'll place them on top of the clavicles when you're working with your partner. And all you're trying to do is feel sensation in the body. Where is the breath emanating? So yours is a little more intercostal and up. So the shape of the lung, just really quick. The shape of the lung is large. And when we use the diaphragm, which is the muscle that's shaped right here, and we breathe correctly, the diaphragm will flatten out, expand out, which will allow us to breathe deep down into the lower lobes of the lung. The reason why this is important is this is connected with the parasympathetic responses in the nervous system. So the deeper we breathe, the more relaxed we are. 
the more shallow we breathe and more into the chest, the more tension, the more stress is in our body, etc. So on me, take a feel on my clavicles and tell me if you feel any movement. And then place your hands on my intercostals and tell me if you feel any movement. Nope. And then place your hand on my belly and my lower back and tell me if you feel a movement. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, I can have you sit. Okay. okay. So, the idea is, is that we're sinking our breath down into the lower lobes. So, there's a little science here, too. There's obviously an imperative part of the process of meditation is at least understanding, at least in my opinion, some of the physiological functions in our body as we breathe. So, we can maximize how much we can have an effect on controlling mind. Right? So if somebody sits in meditation and they go on their meditation and they're breathing big into the chest and this kind of stuff, it's not going to be as productive because of what happens physiologically in the body as if they're breathing here, softly and deeply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll have you partner up. Just grab anybody. Obviously you two in the back can do this and then maybe the two in the second row, and then two and two. Is that fair enough? And just feel what type of breather you are, initially at first, okay? And maybe we can pause that for now and then come back. So hands on clap poles and just tell me what you feel. Tell me what you do. And now I should probably be thinking about breathing and talking to so much in a little bit. Okay. Now. Intercostals, which are right here, just right there, fine. And then half, yep, and then lower back. She's more conscious. So you see how when you make your, you draw your attention there, and all of a sudden that's easy. <laughs> Abdominal breathing should be the way you breathe all the time. Hands on the clavicle, intercostals and the abdomen. There's no movement in her clavicles, so she may be more intercostal. Women oftentimes breathe here. Sometimes they places. Yeah, I don't know. Is that supposed to be? Yeah, I don't know. You're always supposed to feel it here, but she's feeling it all three places. Yeah. Okay. Um. So again, that's just a, it, this allows you to have a little bit of investigation into yourself through the use of a partner. And some of you have, have a you know, personal spiritual discipline of practice already, and you may already be doing this. So some of the traditions, they talk about just the directing your attention to the breath and just observing the breath and trying to make it softer, long, slow, deep, and just really slowing things down. So, for example, in the yoga traditions, there's something called full yogic breathing, which I'm just going to touch on just because you were somewhat doing that, where the breath, you fill in the abdomen first, then the inner colsters, and then the chest rises last. And this is the most complete breath. It would be hard to do this all day long. It would be hard to breathe in this way where you have this full expansion all day long. But when you're standing or when you're in a seated position, it may just happen naturally if you've had a practice of that nature. Right? We do this in Kriya Yoga where there's this big, huge depth of breath. But as a general rule of thumb, if you can breathe diaphragmatically, and sometimes people call this belly breathing or abdominal breathing, then you can access the lower lobes of the lungs and you can have a calming effect on your nervous system. Right? All right? It's as simple as that. So we're going to practice something called square breathing just for a few minutes. Now I'm describe what it is. Some people call it box breathing, okay? In yoga, it's called Sahita Kumbhaka. You don't necessarily need to know the traditional names for this stuff, but nonetheless, they have, uh, they've been studying the utilization of breath as a way of focusing the attention and getting into a state of tranquility or meditation um, for thousands and thousands of years. There's a reason why this stuff still sticks, too. So you see people like Andrew Whale and um, uh, what's that, Dr. Oz and... Know, Dr. Phil and all these people talking, at least in, at, at sometimes in their shows and things of this nature, 
um, about the importance of breathing and, and how important it is. It's the first link in addressing the body-mind connection and body-mind programming. Okay? So square breathing is like this. It's an inhalation. It's a hold. An exhalation. And a hold. In. Hold. Exhale. Hold. Okay? And it works like this. So I in. I hold. I exhale. And hold. In. Hold. You're going to do this with me when you're ready. Exhale. Hold. Close your eyes. In. Hold. Exhale. Hold. In. Hold. Eyes closed. Exhale. Hold. A few more. In. Hold. Exhale. Hold. In. Hold. Softly exhale. Hold. Softly in. Hold. Softly out. Three more. Softly in. Hold. Softly out. Hold. Last one. Softly in. Hold. Softly out. Hold. Release the technique and go back to normal respiration. So, how did that feel? Don't all jump up at once. Okay. Ah, say that again. <laughs> it relaxes your nervous system. It relaxes your nervous system. So the beauty about where we're at now today, um, as far as how science is, you know, merging and studying concepts of these old esoteric ideas and philosophies. Not, now we have a, a barometer of measurement to see what these various techniques do. Okay, so I studied a system called buteyko breathing, which was done by a Russian doctor, um, and he developed a system of breathing that he borrowed from the traditions of the East. Russia is really close to India and all that, right? China, etc. Um, and his research was really initially geared towards asthmatics that had onset asthma that weren't born with it but had developed it over the course of time. And he utilized these various breathing uh, techniques to actually completely cure people of asthma and with a success rate that was um, staggering, to say the least. You can look it up. Buteyko, it's B-U-T-E-Y-K-O. So I studied this system for a little while because it gave me some of the science behind um, some of the breath work and some of the things that I've been doing for a long, long, long time. It's nice to know the science and not just be too esoteric about it. Sometimes if we're too wishy-washy, we're really not grounded. And we can't communicate to those that are really looking for that and not necessarily the, you know, kind of far-out thinking. I'm great with the far-out thinking. I love it. But if we can ground ourselves in these types of practices and really understand them from this perspective, sometimes we can kind of have a strong, solidifying foot into starting to develop a practice for ourselves. So there's essentially three steps. Practicing some form of daily quiet time where you either sit with a straight spine, preferably, not leaning back in a chair unless you need to for comfort, eyes closed, directing your attention simply to one thing. In this instance, it's going to be the breath. Okay? So daily practice. All right. Step two. Essentially, 
is to start addressing the alterations of the pattern of your breathing. So when you alter the pattern of breathing, like let's say I do a streak of which is called fire breathing, and I start to do fast respiration, okay? But streak of fire breathing is it increases heat within the body. So I, I do some, uh, it's called like interesting practices. Uh, I studied with a guy by the name of Wim Hof that is known as the Iceman, and I do weekly uh, submerge my body in cold water um, all winter long, 40, 42 degrees or below. Um, and I'm able to regulate my body heat in doing this. Um, don't suggest it to you all. <laughs> Just giving you an idea of the, the power and the, and the, the depth that, that this, these types of practices have. Right? They've been around for a long time, and there's a reason. There's a reason why they kind of keep coming out and coming out and coming out. But for the purposes of meditation, the longer, the slower, and the deeper you can get your breath, the better. So I like to say LSD. It's really easy to remember, right? Okay? Long, slow, deep. So when we manipulate the breathing, so that's part two of this. Part one, again, daily consistent practice. Part two, manipulating the segments of the breath. There's three segments of breath. There's inhalation, there's hold, and there's exhalation. Now there's exhalation or hold after inhale, and there's hold after exhale. So square breathing, a simple tool like this, allows you to get comfortable with all of them, and it actually allows you to equal, uh, equalize your respiration. So some of us take long inhales and short exhales. Some of us take short inhales and long exhales. But very rarely is there an evenness in the depth. And square breathing starts to iron out some of these little details. Right? It's just one of the easiest ones to, for most people to get. There's other practices. There's the one to two breathing. Who mentioned that before? Breathing in for three? It was, I think, you. Yes. Breathing in for three, exhaling for six. We'll talk about that a little bit today as well. But square breathing equals out your respiration, so it activates your parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for rest, digestion, recovery, um, that kind of thing, which m most of us, including myself, need more of that than more of the fast faster style types of respirations. We need restoration for our health and that kind of thing. Okay? And then step three, which also kind of builds on the other two steps, so daily consistent practice, again, step one. Step two is the manipulation or the control of the breath in a very specific pattern. Step three is to always, anytime your mind wanders away from the practice, just bring it back to the breath. All right? And this trains your attention. So, again, if you view attention or if you're trying to embark on this journey of body, mind, mastery, your spirituality, or this, this quest... It takes some strengthening of your attention to really get into these states of quietness. They do exist. They do exist. These, these meditative deep states that teachers have talked about for, you know, anybody from Christ to Buddha, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they exist. I've experienced many of them myself, not to obviously their degree, but um, when I was on that silent meditation retreat, the first three or four days were like, lack of a better way of saying it, like hell. Because my mind was just and then one of my teachers was like, your mind is cleaning itself out and I was aware of the process. I was aware of all these thoughts coming up. They weren't thoughts that were happening without my awareness. They were, I was very concretely aware I'd be breathing in a certain way and then I'd think about, oh, what's for dinner? Or I'd be breathing in a certain way. Oh, uh, why am I here? What's the whole purpose of this, etc.? And I'd be breathing a certain way. Man, these teachers are crazy. You know, uh, millions and millions of thoughts. By day four, nothing, gone. All cleaning out, all cleaning out the subconscious thoughts, all these layers. And then by day five, I was like, wow, this is extremely peaceful. And then by day seven, I didn't want to leave. I actually cried. I cried to my teacher. I, didn't, I didn't really did not want to go back to this world because I knew that I'd either A, lose the sensation and the feelings that I gained from this retreat, or B, I'd have to stay really diligent with the practice, again, daily, consistent practice, in order to maintain that type of uh, peacefulness and tranquility and that kind of stuff. 
and in the area I'm in with my life right now, with my father's health declining, as we were talking about before you all came, now I'm challenged yet again. Right? So this body-mind practice is like this cyclic waves, right? We have these amazing experiences where we're on a retreat, and oh my God, it's so easy. Okay? And then we have these whoa, what did life just throw at us? Like, how do I stay centered in this? We direct our attention. Right? That's the power. That's the power of we've developed the ability to direct our attention, to centering our breath. Then in everything we meet, we have a standing of groundedness in dealing with the situation. So imagine, this is another teaching I like to impart. Imagine if every time somebody upset you, you took five, just five, five long, slow, and deep breaths before you said anything. How would that change your reaction? Just imagine if every single time somebody really irritated you and you just went, Give me five breaths. Would that change your reaction? Would you maybe say something that was a little more loving and compassionate versus something that was reactive? Right. Think about it. So the power of the breath is something that sometimes really kind of escapes people. Oh, it doesn't work. Well, the next time you get angry, Take five long, slow, and deep breaths before you react. And I will guarantee you it will change your reaction. All right? All right let me see how we're doing on time. Because that can kind of go on and on and on. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much over. <laughs> so we'll do one more. One more. Okay? So if you are stressed and you kind of need to deflate, Right? Like you've had a really you know, tough, tough situation um, in your day. One of the breathing exercises that is super extremely powerful in this regard is the one to two breathing ratio. And I'll explain why, and then we'll do it for just a few minutes, and then um, I'll open it up for kind of a short Q&A. One to two breathing is simply just trying to have a longer exhale than your inhale. The ratio is what's one to two. So let's say your inhale is a three count, your exhale is maybe a six count. What's important here is that you don't strain the breathing apparatus. That you don't, okay, one, two, three, then exhale. You know, this kind of thing. Like trying to extend it out, like that's, that won't work. That'll just make it worse, right? It's just about softness. And the analogy I like to use is this. If somebody is relieved something stressful is over, Usually they will go, oh, thank God that's over. Very rarely does somebody go, thank God that's over. <laughs> right? Breathe in nice and deeply, fast, that kind of thing. But what are you told when it's like, you know, when you're stressed? Breathe deeply. Slow exhale is better, better advice. Depth of breath can be important. But first start to slow down. Okay? Just slow down the exhale. Relax. Okay? So we're going to do a short count of this, just a three in, six out. I'll keep it pretty, pretty moderate. And what this does is this actually activates the vagus nerve that runs from our brain through our heart and our lungs down into our digestion. One of the most common things that accompanies people that are stressed and have anxiety and these kinds of issues on a regular basis is usually irritation in the stomach, stomach aches, um, that kind of stuff, right? It's usually accompanied with that. Usually they suffer some type of regular indigestion or it comes out six months later and they're like, wow, man, I'm getting stomach aches every single day and they've had six months of stress and didn't have a tool and a way of deflating the stress. So now it starts to affect the other parts of your body. So when your mind's affected, your body's affected. And the reverse goes the same. So when your body's in sickness, your mind is much less likely to be able to become centered. It's still possible. It can be done. But it's harder. It's harder. That's why diet and nutrition and all these things are, are important. Or 
very important. So what we're going to do is, again, we're just going to close the eyes and breathe in and then breathe out. In, join when ready. Out. And soft. Out, soft. In. In softly. Out softly. In. Out. Out, soft, just a few more, in, out, in, and let go. You open your eyes. So when you do this, a, a helpful visual is to think of almost like a rolling pin moving through your body as you exhale, and that you're taking all the dark anger or whatever emotional content, and you're letting it be pushed out through your body. And the best place to do this is connected to Mother Earth, bare feet. Have you ever heard of grounding before? I know you have. <laughs> the idea of connecting to the Mother, connecting to the Earth. The Earth has a magnetic field. And when we are literally skin, bare feet, on the Earth, sounds weird. There's a whole documentary about it now. Have you seen that, by the way? Oh, you do? Okay. Curious. Okay. <laughs> um, simple as just touching the earth every single day. We're so, in this culture, we're so, like, shielded from getting our feet dirty and shit like this. Sorry. <laughs> but that's who I am, so <laughs> that's what you get on camera. Is there anything to putting spoons on your feet for grounding? I was told that one. Well, because of winter, I'm not going to go stand outside. 30 seconds. 30 seconds right in the, in the snow and then go back in. <laughs> Seriously. That's all. I mean, literally, literally, you just take two breaths, feet connected to the earth, um, and that regular exposure to cold, 30 seconds isn't going to do any harm to anybody's body. Well, actually, your, your blood vessels will acclimate over the course of time and will actually get stronger and you'll be able to actually develop a, a resistance or a tolerance to cold that's a little higher than what the typical typical person is but especially during summertime obviously it's easier to get out there and barefoot walk i haven't heard of the spoon thing so i'm not gonna uh, claim i have an answer for that but i know if i, I you know I've, I've had clients that have come to me specifically for teaching and you know learning meditation for me as i teach these disciplines and i've had a few people come to me throughout the years that have had like severe anger anger issues and just been like i'm gonna just explode you know kind of thing and i said you know what one of the first things I want you to do is anytime you get angry, if you can separate yourself from the situation, is take your shoes off, take your socks off, go outside and take a five-minute walk right on the earth. And I will guarantee you that five minutes later, you'll be like, oh, my God. It'll be like night and day difference. But you have to be touching the earth. It has to be grounding. It can't be like cement. And, you know, like, I mean, it can to a degree. But you're better off right in the dirt, right in the grass, connected to the mud. It nourishes and supports you every day. Every day. Go ahead. Question. 
Now, um, I'm just wondering for your situation, do you find yourself sleep less hours when you're doing all this breathing, healthy breathing? Do you mm -hmm. less? Yeah, I can sleep. Um, I can feel refreshed and energized off of, you know, five and six hours of sleep. However, I'm um, highly physical. I teach martial arts. I train the body regularly. Um, I'm exploring gymnastic strength right now, so I'm playing around with like rings and I'm trying to do what like gymnasts do and stuff. So there are days where I'm very, very sore. Have you and always been a person that sleeps very little though from the beginning? No. No, by no means, no. I've been one of those kids that used to, on Saturday, sleep into like 9, 10, or 11 o'clock when I was younger. Yeah, I, I would have long sleep cycles at, at certain points. As I've developed the, the, these, these uh, techniques of breathing and have practiced them throughout the years, um, the less sleep I seem to require and less my training is very intense. And if my physical training is very intense, then I, I, I do take eight uh, hours of sleep. On a consistent basis, it's usually between, about, it's right around six or seven. Um, but preferably for most people, I would suggest eight initially, eight to nine, um, especially if health is of a factor right now and you're dealing with something within uh, that you have to address for healing because sleep is a very, very important aspect of the healing process. But yeah, we'll open up for Q&A. Go ahead. You suggested in the morning, like I heard to meditate in the morning before the day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something called yoga nidra. Um, that is, it's it's uh, um, it stands for yoga sleep essentially. That's what it means. Um, and there are some very helpful um, 15 minute to half hour um, like YouTube clips or CDs and uh, audios you can get um, online that will take you through a full body total relaxation. Um, either from your feet all the way up to your head or from your head down to your feet segmentally relaxing and paying attention to each part of the body. So again, this kind of, again, goes back to the notion of where's your attention. So these the types of uh, audios will have you like maybe start at the top of your head and pay attention to your head and relax. Go to your forehead, pay attention to your forehead and relax. Go to your eyes. Relax your eyes, go to your cheeks. When you go through your body in this way, you will find areas of the body that you carry tension in. And that you will find that being able to direct your attention in those areas of the body will help you release at least some of that tension. All right. So yes, yoga nidra is very, very powerful at night. If you don't have time for that, just simply lie on your back and breathe long, slow, and deep. And as you're exhaling, there's a technique that comes from Qigong. This is one of the six healing sounds. And it, when you exhale, imagine that your whole body is being relaxed into your mattress, just falling and falling. As you go, H E E, and then you breathe in. And you just keep repeating that. Now, you can do that internally, like if you're sleeping next to somebody or something like that, you don't want to wake them up. Um, you can just make the sound internally. Okay, vibration is very powerful. One more question, sure. So, if you like waking them, so if you go to sleep fine and you wake in the night and your head turns on, you mm -hmm. it happens to me too. That, mm -hmm. like, For you, it sounds like you answered your own question. Okay. Do you follow? Yeah. Stay laying Stay down. Okay. Stay laying down. You just said, for me, when I get out of bed, it's like, now I'm like wide awake and fully engaged again. It does vary per person. And that's why there's so many different kind of pathways of the same mountain, right? You know, I've studied a lot of them. So I've spent a lot of time with various traditions. And some of them are more of a devotional characteristic, like bhakti yoga, like they're, they have a very devotional kind of quality. And then there are some that are more meditative in quality. And then there are some that is more service to humanity. Kind of these pathways of the mountain of enlightenment, so to speak. But they're all equal. And there are, there's no judgment as far as like one being better than the other, right? Um, so for you, you have to develop your own individualized practice by self-study. 
okay, does this really work for me? You know? And if, say, I taught you square breathing today and you go, this doesn't, this feels horrible. Like, this doesn't feel good. Then it wouldn't be appropriate for you right now. And maybe there's something else I could show you that would work better. Right? Okay. All right. So, any other questions? Yes? The risk of boring Hmm. And there's a script. You record the script yourself so that you talk to yourself when you play it back. Hmm. And there are three stages. One is the um, progressive relaxation mm -hmm. um, that you give yourself cues for. And the second is, I think it's the warming. I feel uh, a warmth in my toes. And mm -hmm. Okay. You hold this little thermometer. It has to be a regular, non-automatic thermometer. Mm -hmm. And you record the temperature before that happens and after. And there's an actual increase mm -hmm. in, in the physical temperature. Mm -hmm. And then, if you are in the therapist's office, you can have your brain waves monitoring. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about... Um, well, I can't think of the name right now. Biofeedback. Yeah, that's actually what I was looking for. Yeah, yeah. But you can do that every night. Mm -hmm. And if I did, it worked. And, um, okay. I don't have the tape anymore, but I do have the script. Mm, mm, gotcha. And it starts with, I'm beginning to feel quite quiet. And then... Goes on from there. Yeah, there's, there's something to be said about brainwave technology. I to get warm. Mm-hmm. And you know that that's not the point. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I went there because I had a job issue and I was going to have to find another one in two weeks and I called this guy and I said I need a jolt in self-confidence mm. and I need it by Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. No pressure. Yeah, thank you for sharing. <laughs> Yeah, there's all kinds of methodologies out there. Yeah, you know, there there are on on uh, Spotify and Google Play and all these like you know things. Now there's Theta Wave things that you can get and Delta Waves. You can you can get these downloads that do like um, by what's called binaural beats, where you you know wear a set of headphones and the left ear has a different rhythm or beat pattern than the right ear, and then you know that puts you into a theta state or delta state or alpha state, that kind of thing. Well, this is pretty low tech. This okay. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? Come up for anyone. One more. One more. Sure. Signing, like a word mm -hmm. or a sound. Like so. Sometimes when you and like for me, meditation is new and I'm trying, but mm -hmm. it does feel like it eludes me because my brain just doesn't. Like I want to think of everything else except breathing. Mm -hmm. And so they say sometimes set a word or a sound, mm -hmm. and if you are just not able to focus on the breath and that's not getting you that if you set your but sometimes the word like I get annoyed with the word like, I don't isn't the mind tricky right <laughs> <laughs> you said monkey brain it was like ding 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 that yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it's like a wild out of control monkey so he, here's again uh, just to, to reiterate it's um, the observance that the mind has shifted away from your initial focus of breath or whatever the case may be. The observance of that process and bringing it back is a success each and every single time. It is literally a repetition of becoming stronger in that process. Mm -hmm. And everybody goes through this process. I haven't met a meditator out there mm -hmm. that hasn't gone through this process of initially when I first started to meditate I couldn't, you know, I, I just couldn't hold my attention and my mind would go everywhere and blah, da, 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 right? And then eventually, with consistency and with practice, you start to develop, like, let's say now it's five seconds that your attention is on to the one thing that you're trying to focus. Well, three weeks later, it might be 10. And then two months later, it might be 15 seconds. And then six months later, it might be three to five minutes, etc. Usually the duration of time 
over the consistent practice, as long as you're doing it on a regular basis. So whatever that means for you, morning, noon, night, that's why it's an individualized thing. So you have to just, you say, this is the time I'm going to do this. And hopefully you have some support in your life that'll, that allows you to do that, like support of loving family members and things like that. That is important. You know, that is very important. I'm lucky, I, I'm, you know, I have an amazing girlfriend. Uh, she's the most amazing woman I've ever dated. Um, and, you know, I have that kind of support, you know, and I, I hope you guys do too. Because uh, it's really powerful to be able to be like, you know, be supported in your spiritual conquest in your journey. Because to me, that is the most important. That's why we're here. I mean, we're here to love and serve each other and help each other in this process of understanding who we are. That's the life. Go ahead. Are you still benefiting from your meditation if you're still aware of, like, all the sounds and everything that's going on around you mm -hmm. in the house or whatever? Yeah. Okay, because, like, I sometimes wonder if I meditate it right when it's over because I can hear... So if they come in the room, mm -hmm. I can hear them coming in the house. Mm -hmm. Do you bring your attention back? Right? <laughs> Again, the mind does that, right? So the mind goes, oh, I heard the door. Who is that? Versus, oh, I'm supposed to be oming. <laughs> or I'm supposed to be breathing in this particular way or whatever. Um, mantra practice is very powerful for those of you that have a hard time with just the breath. Mm -hmm. So for you in the back mantra practice, okay? And one of the easiest mantras, one of the most universal, is all. Yeah. I like your idea about, you know, the breathing being a way to focus. Mm -hmm. Because I always, well, I used to think of it as thermometer, thermostat. Thermometer being the thing that reacts, the thermostat sets the temperature. Mm -hmm. And I used to, you know, instead of reacting to the noise or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know, but I always had trouble. How do I set that thermostat? But that breathing, Okay, I can change it to focus. Correct. Breathing. Yeah. The breath is the link. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the common link amongst all the traditions. Yeah. I did the breathing, but I never put it together as mm -hmm. the focus. See, you have focus on yourself breathing in and out, and that's all you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, picture something that's hard. Mm -hmm. Focus on my mm -hmm. <laughs>